later. Yep. And, uh, yeah, they won't miss anything except uh, some introduction. <laughs> All right, so uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm very happy to uh, be here to present this talk about machine learning approaches on music information retrieval. Uh, I found it's pretty fascinating because like I found, like, like I put it here, it's a combination of art and science. We have music and uh, machine learning, uh, pretty cool stuff. And uh, like uh, David earlier said, I uh, feel like AI is taking over the world. And, uh, and then if, uh, if, if, if it can take over the language, then, and especially the universal language like music, then, well, it's really something we should, uh, uh, we should pay more attention right now, nowadays. So, um, all right, then let's get started. Uh, first, I want to uh, talk a little bit about me, a brief introduction. So um, um, I'm right now a quantitative risk analyst at NRG Energy, which is an energy company at the Princeton, New Jersey, uh, and uh, right next to the beautiful campus of Princeton University. Uh, and I've been there for a couple of years. Uh, and for my academic background, I, I had a, a Master of Science in Mathematical Finance and a Bachelor of Engineering Automation from Tianzhou University. Uh, well, these two pictures basically shows my uh, background and um, for the daily work, I would uh, deal with all the time series and hedging risk and derivative pricing, stochastic process, which are somehow related. And, and uh, in my old days, I would be a pure engineer and uh, I had to play around with uh, uh, auto cars, things like that. Well, you may have the question now, none of this have anything to do with music. Well, that's true. <laughs> well, I'm not, uh, I'm not a very big aggressive believer of the old wonders, but uh, uh, this kind of leads to the purpose of my talk today is I want to show that how we can borrow ideas from different fields and what machine learning makes it possible to deal with all this uh, interdisciplinary uh, field of research. And probably we can get all get some inspirations into our own world and our own passion into uh, the, either its research or industry. All right, so um, let's get started. So um, I want to start it from uh, some, some history here. Uh, so the, the endeavor that people trying to solve music or explain music with science can trace back to the ancient, uh, like the ancient Greeks, like I showed here. Here we have our uh, uh, Pythagoras. Uh, we all know that his famous uh, theorem for triangles, but what we, we, we don't know that his connections to the origin of music. So this is not only the origin of music and math, but also the origin of music itself. Or most likely, that's uh, the, the, the most back that we can trace. And um, so what happened is one day that Pythagoras was, was taking a walk. So all the great things always happening when the uh, people are taking the walk. Then he passed by a blacksmith shop. He heard the, some hammer hitting the metal and uh, he did some other observations, like the heavier the sheet, the heavier of the metal, and the lower the pitch, the sound that it could make. And sometimes the sound, uh, the, the hitting makes are pleasant, but sometimes they are very harsh and which even offend your ears. Like, that's the word to put it. And uh, of course that draws his attention. So he went back home to do all the experiments. Like uh, here with, a, with, a, with a, some uh, tough strings and he tried to play around with the strings and the glasses fill with different amount of water and the bells as you can see here with different size and even pipes. So that's, <laughs> we, we, we can see that it almost covers all the music in form of the music instruments nowadays. And what he found out is very interesting. That, for example, for the strings, the ratio of the string really makes a difference. It's what makes a, whether it's a harmonious sound or it's, a, or it's an unpleasant sound. So this ratio, and when he played with, for example, if you half the string, the sound it would make which sounds very, uh, very similar to the whole string length. So that goes back to later on that people would discover that that's because of the, uh, the theory of the wave. If you have the wavelength, then it's basically the same if the frequency would stay. With the frequency change, but uh, they, uh, I think this is what they call it, it's, uh, the same phase or yeah, <laughs> there's some uh, physics I, I can, can, cannot remember right now. But uh, the point is, during this experiment, he found the quantitative relationships among the music. 
And uh, uh, there's even the theory that it is him that who developed the same scales. By saying scale, I mean the, the series of uh, e, uh, the ascending or descending music notes, and even the harmonies that are accompanied by the, by the melody. So there's uh, even, um, uh, he, he, even the rumor that uh, it, is, it is after this very set of uh, experiments that uh, Pythagoras said that his, uh, set his motto for the school is the number rules the universe. All right, so um, not many years after Pythagoras, there's another great man who is the father of modern astronomy, Johannes Kepler, and we're all familiar with his the three theorems of the planetary. And uh, you see, he also um, put himself into the research of, uh, of, of music. And here's what, he, here's his, uh, I take a piece of his work, and uh, uh, I think it's even in Latin. Uh, and uh, in this book, there are two big ideas. The first is his third law of planetary motion. And the second is that each planet sings a song. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of, uh, it's really inspiring ideas at that time. As you can see here, he, uh, uh, he even, uh, I don't know how he did it, but uh, he, uh, he said, this is what a Saturn sun would look like and a Jupiter. And at the end, he even gives a uh, sun to the moon. And these are all the planets that uh, were well, known at that time. All right, so uh, that's basically what's uh, um, music and physics. And pretty recently, here's another piece. It's, uh, it's by Schomburg. It's a very uh, recent um, great master of the musicians, and he developed this serial music. And the people call it the relativistic music. So you may find it uh, have some connections to relativity, you're right. So that's, this theory is proposed uh, right around uh, Einstein proposed uh, his general relativity theory. So uh, it's pretty funny. So um, I won't don't want to spend too much on that with these theories about, but basically it says something about no note should be more important than another. Uh, basically, that's the sense of relativity here. And some composers, music, musicians even uh, acknowledge it as the um, way that music move out of the world of Newton and into the world of Einstein. So um, I want to show this uh, three pieces of history to conveyed an idea that uh, is really inevitable that we to learn music along the way that without any science or technology. And all the, all the great people in the history, they were trying to uh, solve the problem of science and they also endeavor them, dev devoted themselves to, the, uh, to solve the, the music. So it's always been a hard task and it's always been a whole dimension as uh, you would have put it here. Uh, it's hard because it's content too much geometry for musicians and too much music for geometers. And especially hard in the old days without the, without the power of any uh, electricity and, or the computer and uh, people can only learn this in, in, on themselves and put everything in their mind and put up, put up the theories as, uh, as, as it goes. So even as genius as, as Mozart, and he had to spend most of his time, uh, whether it's free or not, to, into the pure music. He cannot spare any effort on uh, the geometrist or any uh, scientific way to explain the music. And uh, probably, uh, the, the, probably the, the only person who was trying to do this recently is uh, uh, Feynman, Richard Feynman, physicist, and because he's, uh, he's a good bongo and congo drums player in the orchestra. But that's not enough. But luckily, we now have a powerful machine. With a machine, we can do more. It's something that we don't, we don't have to, some calculations would take a human for years and or the whole life to do. And, but now with a machine, it can be done in seconds. And a lot of ideas can be tested. A lot of theorems can be experimented. And so, uh, so what here I put together a little chart to show what's, uh, what's a general uh, process for, uh, for, for the computer science perspective to, to detect or to unveil the music theory. Uh, so it always, we can now, we can de decompose the music piece and then we can do pattern recognition, which is um, wildly 
uh, use the technology uh, into the image or computer vision field. And we can do some feature extractions. And also it's, uh, it's already been used in uh, natural language processing and uh, even some uh, um, uh, social network, uh, social network um, modeling. And finally, we can get music information retrieval. It comes back to uh, the topic of, uh, of my talk today. So, um, but uh, it's still kind of vague. So what kind of information, where should we start? And especially for music information, uh, well, it's still, like I said, it's vague. And uh, if people make comments on a piece of music, there's no right and wrong. And so that's really, uh, I guess that's, uh, it's like a, a psychology. It's really in between of a natural science and a social science. So what can we do about that? Uh, well, that's uh, something that's uh, our project trying to solve. Uh, I think I forgot to mention this, this project is uh, it's a long lasting project that we were trying to uh, solve the, uh, uh, try to solve the music, not solve the music, try to explain like um, how, how this music in common and find some common characteristics and how we can handle, how we, it's also an endeavor that, endeavor that we, we try to put together to use computer science to explain music. Whew, all right, let's uh, get started. So uh, here comes the, the prelude of uh, uh, our project. Uh, again, I want to talk a little bit about uh, inspirations. So this picture, it's a picture from a national textbook for primary school. That's where I came from in, in China, back in China. And uh, it's in the grade six lesson. And um, this, this story basically tells uh, along the Rhine River, and there was a poor family with a brother and a sister. Here's a brother and a sister. They all love music very much, but the sister was blind and I think their parents left them so they don't have enough money. Although they, they love music, I think they, they use all their uh, savings to buy this uh, old piano. <laughs> then uh, they, they, were, they were talking about music all day and luckily there was this night and Beethoven was taking a walk and uh, uh, he, heard, he overheard the conversation. So he came in and played a piece for them. And now a sudden gust of wind from the open window that puffed the candle out. As you can see, there's even smoke remaining here. Uh, and the moonlight poured onto the piano. With a mix of emotions and Beethoven improvised this masterpiece, a Moonlight Sonata. I guess it's, um, it's it's a well, it's a well known song and re well recognized song, and um, that's uh, how the origin of this um, uh, this masterpiece. However, that's only <laughs> a fairy tale. That's the publisher trying to <laughs> trying to tell to the students. I guess that's when I, the first time I trying to uh, question against everything, and it will and it was in the textbook. Uh, the, the true story is that Beethoven was at a time that he was almost completely deaf and he just parted from his only love. The reason he couldn't be together is because uh, the, the, the woman he fell in love with was a daughter of a duke. Although Beethoven was very already a famous musician at that time, but the girl was 14 years younger than him and uh, the Duke, uh, and then nobody could, uh, could stand Beethoven's uh, bad temper. <laughs> so uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's when uh, he composed that song, uh, Moonlight Sonata, and he used that to, uh, uh, and he used that as a farewell gift to, to, to his only love. Well, uh, although we have the fairy tale and uh, it's very completely different interpretations, uh, from uh, the real Beethoven situation, but they are somehow they, they, they share some uh, similarities, uh, like I want to show here. Well, in, uh, for the blend, for, for the publisher, they, their story with the blend goal, and for the Beethoven, it's a, it's almost a deaf Beethoven, and it's a poor family that corresponds to the poor Beethoven situation that he's in. Uh, I think I saw the movie that's depicting that uh, period of Beethoven. He had to uh, put his eyes, he would lean his, uh, his face on the piano to feel the vibrations to, to compose. And after that, it's, uh, in, the, in, the, in the fairy tale, we have a peaceful night. In the real Beethoven, it represents his beautiful love. And the moonlight can be also be a representative for the hope and the love itself. 
So the, uh, the point that I'm trying to make here, although it's very completely different interpretations, but somehow they're trying to convey the same emotions. And uh, probably the publisher didn't even, it's not a musician himself, but I only listen to the music that we share some common ground. So that leads to uh, this can uh, our study and uh, it's uh, it's under the field of music information retrieval and it's widely used nowadays and uh, uh, with machine learning of course and uh, for example the recommend recommender systems in Spotify and Apple Music they are using the audio data or even some labels into recognize what people share uh, interest in the songs or what kind of uh, new songs. Uh, certain group of people would like to hear. And music generations, that's another big group part of the research, uh, which is lead, led by the Google's team, that's what's called Magenta. Hopefully we will have time to discuss this briefly today. Uh, I did some experiments with that. Uh, and uh, so what if we can let the computer uh, compose itself and something very similar to shopping or some very similar to Beethoven. And of course, there's some uh, uh, categorization um, problem needs to be solved, uh, which is beneficial to musicology itself or the history of music and even uh, trying to help us find the purpose of art. All right, so uh, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. So object research, uh, we picked the classical music. So why is classical music? Why not hip hop or why not alternative rock or any other uh, kind of the, the music form? Well. well Every time when people are talking about classical music, you, the first image you can came up to mind probably is the piano around, and uh, it must be a symphony, or there's a conductor with a stick. Well, necessary though, that I, I go to the uh, Wikipedia. This is the definition of Wikipedia. It's an art music produced or rooted in the traditional Western music, including religious and secular music. Or this is an explanation from the Oxford dictionaries. It's in traditional and the serious styles. And, and also there's a Longman dictionary has the, its own the definitions of music that people consider serious and has been popular for a long time. So this kind of uh, makes a point that why we want to uh, research on the classical music because uh, it always has a lot of deep meanings and uh, it contains rich emotions. that is something in common with the uh, different definitions and it has the everlasting glory. And uh, well, you may say, uh, and another big point is um, classical music is very high, well structured, and a lot of um, this studies showed that a lot of, a lot of modern music uh, like uh, pop and um, jazz and even uh, even some of the rock uh, were originated from the um, part of our classical uh, Western classical music. And be more specifically, uh, we're going to focus on these three composers, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. And uh, uh, the reason is they are in the, in the period that uh, before them there was Baroque time, and after them there's a Romantic uh, period, and they kind of share some common characteristics of all the um, other, uh, other classical music. And uh, here's, a, here's a quote from Mozart, the music even in the most terrible situations must never offend the ear. So that's also kind of um, the motto for at that time, the people, um, the composers trying to make the music well structured and it will, it will be a, a good starting point for us to find some common links or um, some information can be retrieved from there. All right, some uh, preparation um, uh, here, I want to, um, brief some of the basic ideas for in, in the in the in the modern or the modern music that's uh, so that we uh, in case of somebody not familiar with these terms the first is the staff and notes uh, for pressing staff that's basically uh, the notation here with the five lines uh, with the four spaces in between and uh, uh, the notes uh, are symboled on, on inside or on top of the staff, and uh, which we can say do re mi fa sol la still. That's a, that's an octave, um, and some other things we need to uh, were some other data, or I should, I, I'm putting data preparation that we can extract it from the uh, music piece, and, like the duration of the note. Say so here is a whole note, and we have half note, and even quarter note, eight note. They uh, they have different durations, and uh, as usually when the composer composes music, they would uh, divide them into different bars. Uh, and uh, there is also time signature. Uh, yeah, for the sake of time, I will just skip most. Uh, if you, if any of the things 
um, confused you at one point, please feel free to ask a question. I think I'll try to keep an eye on the chat chat box, and uh, uh, I don't know whether if you feel you get confused, can also feel free to, to stop me. All right. So with that, there's a uh, uh, there's a modern uh, database um, uh, format for for this music. Uh, this called MIDI, and uh, with this, we can have a matrix extracted from each of the music piece, and it has the onside, meaning which note uh, at at what time that this note starts and how long it's it's going to last. That's the duration and which channel it's in, because. Uh, especially for some big symphony, we're, we're going to have different uh, instruments and different channels. And uh, what's the what's the pitch of that note? And even some other and uh, it's like a velocity and uh, and uh, measure measurement in seconds. So we're, we collected all the data from Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, most of their uh, piano pieces uh, to start with. And uh, here's a little bit uh, visualization for. For, the, for what the, the data looks like. So earlier, I tried to introduce the, uh, the idea of this uh, uh, of this um, uh, with not notation with a staff, uh, and uh, I just I guess this here is a crisp point that I mentioned. Uh, this is not the only approach to to study music. Uh, there's another school that's trying to uh, do all the uh, analysis from the audio input like a wave like a wave like something you can you can pull out from your mp3 player and but here we try to um, extract the data in the in the format like it's digital and uh, we can we, we can uh, we can it's called quantify each element of the note and as as we can see here um, the two the two nodes the difference the pitches difference between these two uh, adjacent nodes that's what we call interval and if we put two intervals in a plot that's going to look like something like this and if we want to look at the music in the time series sense we can uh, only draw out the contour or uh, the pitch length of the highest note or whatever note you pick from um, that's a, the, from from the notes that happening in the same uh, same time all right. With all this preparation, uh, we're finally ready to move to our first uh, uh, first um, project, which is um, called Mem Melody Extraction uh, using machine learning algorithms. That's of course. Uh, so first, I need to define what is a Mem Melody. The Mem Melody is um, like a repeated piece. Some songs that's really catch you. It's very catchy, and uh, probably especially I think it's, this is especially applies to um, um, classical music. Sometimes you you heard a symphony going on. You said, "Oh, I, I probably I never heard that before." Then there's a main theme or subject or motif as tonato phrase came out. You said, "Oh, I recognize that. That's the that's a symphony number no. five from Beethoven." So that's something we want to pay more attention on, and uh, that's something. Um, uh, Back in the old days, we can only ask, okay, ask uh, experienced musicians, what do you think is most important in, in this piece? But now with the machine learning, with, with all the computer power, we can, we can, we can let it decide by, by the computer, <laughs> by the algorithms. And why is it important? Because it's a carry of the emotions and the music styles, and uh, uh, there might be some hidden patterns. How do we do that? It's very hard. And they can vary a lot. Uh, like, um, mm, uh, for example, they can vary in pitches. Although they sound similar, uh, like I, I try to explain the, um, the experiment that Pythagoras used um, with a string. If you half the string and play all the music and melody on that half string, it would sound very similar to the uh, to uh, to if you play that same tune on the whole string. So they can vary a lot. If we only look at the pitches, or when we look at the audio input. They are, uh, they, uh, it's only experienced musicians can find. But that's why we, um, uh, in this algorithm, we're trying to uh, solve that with directional patterns and using a dictionary algorithm, which is a very useful algorithm for accelerating, uh, to accelerate machine learning. Um, this is like a preparation step for machine learning. And also uh, it's like a baby, like a baby version of the uh, search trees, which is also one of the most widely used algorithms in machine learning. 
All right, so uh, this slide could be a little bit busy, so I try to I try to simplify it a little bit. So what it does is basically it encodes the music piece and put it into the dictionary, and with with the different iterations, that's why I put a flowchart with the diff with different iterations, and it can um, span out to different rules and with a different like a like a like a tree tree structure. Then we use this. Uh, output as a as a as a as a dictionary of this uh, music then if we if we decode that that's going to reveal the music itself uh so for the sake of time i i, I do have a i do have a uh, i do have a example to show the, the algorithm but for the sake of time i probably going to skip that uh, for anyone interested we can feel free we can talk after the after the after this this presentation so what it does say if we have an input series and by different steps and different iterations, uh, we would uh, we would get this zero one zero as one of the main main um, what do you call it? main melody or main structures in this piece. And uh, say if we only uh, like I through this series is this zero one zero. It's not. It's kind of hidden. And it is, it's only a baby example. Uh, imagine if we looking at a series that's the last uh, thousands long, right? Okay, so um, what I can do is show you some of uh, the results that's, uh, uh, that's run after this, this, pro this, this program. So we, uh, we have this, uh, let's see whether it works. Uh, let me know if you can't uh, hear, the, hear the sound. All right. So I, I hope you guys caught that. So that's uh, so this is uh, this is really uh, this is how uh, the algorithm works for for a long piece of um, a music a music piece, and we can um, use its algorithm to extract the main melodies, and we can focus on only this this part this portion of the melody. And I pick this for Elias. It's a pretty well known for everybody into this. This um uh, this main part is very catchy and everybody can now uh, it's a good way to validate our, our model, uh, and this is uh, all presented in in this paper. Um, and uh, for the interested, you can uh, have a look at into the more details. So um so in general, it's a compression compression problem, or it's an extraction problem. We can say both way, but we we tackle that from the perspective of compression, and what it does to machine learning. Well, uh, compression is the most difficult part in machine learning and, and, data, and data mining because everybody tells machine learning, although we have the, uh, the amount of the um, computing power, but the data set is also, you know, it's also very huge. And uh, we, we, if, what if we can find uh, some appropriate representation of the data? That's really uh, help improve the algorithms a lot. And uh, for for the people who experiment a lot of algorithm themselves, they may uh, have they, they, we, we all have this uh, uh, old saying that's uh, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> what if we can uh, uh, we can't just toss all the information to computer? And uh, even with the uh, machine learning, deep learning, it's not uh, powerful enough to uh, filter out the noise for us. And with this kind of technology, with compression and with this dictionary based, with tree based algorithm, we can reduce the problem set a lot. So that compression can uh, satisfy this, and, but there's no free lunch because uh, uh, the uh, and uh, you there's a balance between how much information you want to plug in and uh, uh, how accurate the results you expect it to see, uh, and uh, this algorithm the LZ, which is represented by two uh, two people who propose this algorithm, uh, they are very uh, they are very um, use, useful in the preparations for a lot of machine learning algorithms. And this has come from the paper from the uh, machine learning uh, review in the, uh, in, in the IEEE conference. So, uh, I, so here I want to diverge the topic a little bit uh, since I'm a quantitative analyst. Uh, so uh, we, I also did some um, applications in uh, financial markets and hope uh, and to, to can give you another uh, sense at how uh, this algorithm looks like. So what I did is I applied this algorithm on the weekly uh, US um, gasoline price 
And although we have um, only three states, here I only use three states to represent the time series, meaning zero means it stays the flat, and one means it goes up, and two means the price is going to go down. Uh, and uh, still, we got uh, pretty good results. Although, uh, you see here, um, these patterns in this algorithm can trace back to the frequency and the location where this, uh, the, these patterns appeared at, uh, um, previously and the length of uh, this pattern. So here we, uh, from here we can um, uh, actually, uh, colleagues and I, we were trying to, uh, to derive more, like a more insightful information from this step. All right, so uh, uh, that's basically wrap up my first part of the talk. And uh, here I feel like, um, so for the people who, uh, who want to know more about machine learning, I want to give a very brief, uh, um, a very brief overview. So it's, uh, it really starts from Alan Turing and uh, uh, with, uh, with the question that can, can machine think? Uh, and, um, here are the earliest, uh, uh, like one of the earliest, um, um, the real depth, not real, it's like uh, strict definitions that people are giving, uh, giving to machine learning. And uh, uh, every time there's, uh, we can we can uh, formulate it as the uh, as a problem, as a task, and we have a performance measure and how uh, and what what are the response or the reactions with uh, with the agents that we we put into this. This machine learning problem. So, uh, as always, people always um, uh, split the machine learning. Although probably this definition become too old, and there are some new ways of classification. But uh, I'm still want to propose uh, put this idea here just for the sake that's. Uh, oops. Oh, sorry. I think something. In my, uh, sorry, guys. Give me a, give me one second. <laughs> Sorry, so I'm using uh, I'm using two monitors here. See, that's another example. That machine is not that powerful. Now, that this is not stable yet. <laughs> not until it's stable enough, we can uh, we can get a powerful machine. <laughs> okay, changes. Let's see. Oh, sorry, guys. All right, does it show up? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet, you're oh, not sharing not yet. Yeah, sorry guys, give me a second. Um, um, monitor. Monitors. Let's see. I right, guess give me one second. Let me uh, reboot this thing. Okay, it's uh it's loading. I'm trying to set up two monitors here, so this uh, can be uh, can be tough. All right, it's okay. I can uh, use this this view. I don't want to hold anybody. Okay. Um, 
Uh, can you guys save now or? Yep, it's there now. It's starting. Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna start from here. All right, let's uh, let's save the effort. I'm gonna uh, skip over all this uh, <laughs> basically uh, introduction. I here's an interesting um, part problem that we I can I can share with you guys. It's uh, uh it's something we come up with my colleagues. It's uh, we can view the machine learning as a coffee making problem. And, and our our task is to uh, is to make some uh, uh, some tasty coffee and our performance measure is the percentage of the tasty coffee that the coffee maker can can come out and uh, in our training experience or the reactions is the people's everyday comments and the supervised learning basically means you uh, you need to give it some uh, uh, some right or wrong answer and say if you punch the machines if every time it spills out or <laughs> and um, and, and at the end of the day, and the, the, the coffee maker could uh, could give them uh, could have a sense of what is good coffee, what is bad coffee. Mm. And for the unsupervised learning, basically means we spoil the machine, and uh, we don't we don't give uh, we don't give any hint that uh, they did, did it either all right or did wrong. And uh, this basically um, formalized like as a clustering kind of problems. And uh, if it's spoiled, and uh, there's going to be a uh, case showing up everywhere, uh, but uh, and uh, but there's going to be a condition. It's a conditional distribution or uh, something like that that would come out. Uh, and um, uh, here is a list from of the top ten machine learning algorithms that I um, uh, that uh, I found in the in the conference. And uh, um, I, if I had time, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about each. Uh, each, uh, give me a second. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, each algorithm, but uh, I will escape uh, here. Uh, I want to call attention on the key means and support vector machines, uh, which is, is related to the uh, to the project that I'm going to talk about next. So, uh, so that's so. Uh, now we have the main melodies, and but uh, it's really nothing else we can do about that. Uh, and uh, for, so, if we want to really we, that's or another way to put it is it is still the music itself. So uh, are there any other ways that we can uh, really pull out some information that's different from music form, different from the music form, and we can uh, understand from other perspectives? Uh, this leads to uh, our next project, which is uh, called the model of the music perception the perceptual theory based on the Markov chains. So what is a Markov chain? Markov chain is a stochastic model that is describing the, a sequence of the possible events in which the probability of each event depends only on the state of the previous. That's kind of uh, boring. <laughs> and so the, the key point from, from this definition is that uh, uh, we have a transition uh, matrix and uh, Markov chain is in mirrorlessness. That's basically the key point. Uh, for example, here uh, we I have, um, um, I have a picture showing that's what the uh, what the Markov chain looks like. Uh, say if we're standing at the state H, and uh, uh, our next step uh, would purely be uh, determined or conditioned on the current state, uh, and that's uh, uh, with this assumption that we can uh, re reduce the time series a lot, and uh, uh, and we can we can see how this uh, transition looks like. And this is also this um, uh, not we really, that's a, this algorithm trying to. Uh, trying to show up. Um, all right. Let's. Uh, however, music have um, uh, has at least uh, two hundred and fifty six states. That's, that's a lot, and the uh, single note level is not even Markov. As we we all have the common sense, if we play one note on the piano on the very left side, and the next is never going to happen on the very uh, very right side of the piano. So uh, we can't. So this model doesn't apply. So how, how are we going to solve that? Well, it's uh, um, if we can somehow scale down the features and make with some proper assumptions, probably that's uh, this problem can go away. And this leads to by this to another theory, which is called uh, implication and realization theory, which is proposed by uh, by Normal and based on the mayor's um, um, some early work. It's like back to 1960s. Uh, and what they do is they split the melody and uh, describe it as a succession of closure, implication, realization. They all sound a little vague. And uh, the, the, the biggest uh, like, uh, point we can borrow here is they, 
kind of classify the music into eight um, melodic archetypes, and which uh, the author would call it the genetic code of melody. And here it's um it's a, it's part of showing that's how how it looks like. Uh, say if we have a three uh, adjacent um, nodes and uh, the first interval, uh, the author would call it unclosed interval. Then there's a, a closed interval. And with uh, by studying the, the relation, the, 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 the author basically argues that uh, this is the, like a basic set of the, the nodes that can evolve. And uh, uh, with this with this with this uh, model, and another thing is we we kind of um, um, put into mathematics mathematics, and we uh, uh, we label that as I, and uh, we put that into the matrix. Um, yeah, that's basically yeah, I simply put it. That's how it looks like. Uh, and uh, for example, if I if we look like a P type, uh, P type in the in the book, the author would argue, okay, that's uh, some ascending uh, ascending series of nodes, and they are not far away from each other. And uh, we would uh, um, we would uh, limit that in the in the strip and uh, in a strip in a strap here, and uh, this area would represent that kind of music uh, music components. With this, we can uh, uh, we can code the music pieces into different uh, uh, into three uh, adjacent uh, uh, nodes, and we label them with uh, uh, with the different um, with different uh, the prototypes. And uh, um, we, we make the assumption that uh, although the music doesn't evolve like a Markov chain, but this uh, small this small box or this small group. That can uh, represent some pattern that evolves like a Markov Markov process, and uh, with um, uh, this is basically um, uh, how the matrix looks like. And we use that to extract the features, and we uh, uh, we do we do the clustering. Yeah, sorry, this is not right. another place I should have, should have making a pause. Um, clustering it's another widely used um, uh, unsupervised machine learning technique uh, that is. Um, um, to 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 for the clustering purpose, and here I used um, a plot to show you how to visualize this process. Basically, if we have a massive amount of data, uh, what we're trying to do is we divide it. We're trying to divide them into different groups and uh, try to find the center of each groups, and that can be a representative of this group of data or as a guideline for this group of data. And here's how the uh, how the how the algorithm looks like. Uh, and uh, we apply this to to our extract features, which is the mark of change that we just uh, aspirated in, in the previous slide. Okay, uh, so let me see. Uh, okay. So the result is we have uh, seven clusters, and uh, this is how they look like. And if even one, they have different ways of moving around. Uh, in between of this, um, uh, of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, what is that? Uh, this space. So, uh, well, this is. Um, so, what can we say about this? So, we can say that if I was given, or the mu or the machine was given the music, it can class. It can give it a label. It's a, which class it's it's in. So we can say it's a class. Uh, we can say uh, um, if we're given a. Uh, uh, 90 uh, late 90s rock we can say is a cluster one music but well that's not still not something we want to look like it's not like our block uh, blocks type is a b or a a b or o it's, uh, we need somehow need more information from that or more insights that's why uh, we also uh, have some uh, abstract factors and we're trying to because we we know data that we are looking at so we label them with different uh, categories from the perspective of emotions and from the perspective of the time when it was composed and the composers himself. And with, with these labels, we try to see, um, with the labels and the clustering results, we try to see whether one factor contributes the most to the music style or the hidden pattern. pattern. Or another question we can ask is, will the seven clusters perform very differently from each other? So with this, uh, I feel like I need to speed up a little bit, so I will just show you 
the way we do that is we vectorize uh, the, uh, the proportions. Let's say here's the example with only from the perspective from only composers. If we vectorize that into a vector and we plot that into a picture, and well, we can see uh, how how um, how how each of these abstract abstract um, um, com composed or abstract factors uh, behaves in each of the clusters that we got from the clustering result. So the way to measure that is a cosine similarity. It's a widely used uh, technology in machine learning to calculate the uh, similarities between time series or any uh, vector-like uh, uh, data to, to get to some, uh, uh, the way to use it is to calculate the uh, geometric means. And it's, it's, it fits our uh, problem uh, perfectly. And this is a, basically, you can see this basically uh, um, a, a formula for the cosine functions, and we uh, we we calculate the geometric mean in each of the categories that we used. Finally, the results come out. So, uh, we finally got something: the time category and uh, the, the similarity between or among uh, between each of the cluster is only seventy-five percent. I know it looks a little big, but uh, in the cosine similarity measurement. Uh, world is already pretty separated uh, stuff. So what we can see, it's uh, probably we are giving a sound. We say this sound is early 50s or this sound is late 70s. That statement probably sounds more rational than that it, it's a sad sound or it's a bad sound or it's a sound uh, composed by John Lennon. So this, uh, this work is uh, presented in this paper for people who are interested, they uh, can go check it out. And we compare our results with other uh, frontiers we saw uh, um, research. And uh, for, for example, here, this is a paper from National Academy of Science, and uh, the authors can, uh, can use only a melody that they can divide between the, uh, the different important time periods in the uh, history of Western classic music. All right, uh, as, as I did earlier, there's some applications in financial markets. And uh, like I said earlier, similarity is always a good measure on time series, cosine similarity. And uh, I would think this is a project we did early, we, we, uh, I did before, uh, trying, to, um, trying to figure out the similarity between all these portfolios, constructions. Uh, and there's some uh, clustering result. It's always a big, it's always a main, the main technique uh, to, to separate them, the, the general market and even some ETFs and some mutual funds using this to uh, build up their own index. Uh, all right, I'm gonna skip this example. And uh, for here, here we have some time, we can uh, briefly mention another school of uh, this kind of research is from the audio data. Here, this is the, I uh, see on top of this picture, it's what we start from, it's a sheet music, or we can call it uh, a symbolic, um, way of research. And there's another group, a lot of research are done in the area that's starting from the recording and start from the audio, like there's a wave patterns and how we can actually, we can apply some Fourier transform or even some signal processing in the digital, uh, digital like, some other transformations like a wavelength transformation and all the algorithms can apply on, on, on audio. Okay, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the frontiers in this area, which is some agenda. Uh, it's a research project by to try with the same goal, trying to create art and music with, uh, with science and machine learning, uh, which is led by Google brand team and uh, uh, in the backup by TensorFlow, which is uh, kind of popular now. It's a big, it's a big engine for machine learning. Um, and here it's something. Let me show you. I think. Uh, hopefully, let's see. Here is something I, uh, um, right guys, wait a second, I'm trying to uh, put this out, okay, let's see, let's see. So here is some, uh, I play around with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with Magenta, and uh, this is the model that they published. Uh, using uh, RNN is a, net, is a neural network, uh, it's a LSTM, and meaning the long short term memory based language model for music notes. And uh, it's widely used for other purposes as well. And the authors want to show how to perform in the music. And this is uh, something I 
I, I composed with uh, with Magenda, mostly Magenda. <laughs> what I did is I usually ask the code for my cousin's name, and this is supposed to be a, a wedding gift to my uh, uh, for my for my cousin who got just got married a couple months ago. Uh, and uh, uh, so that I uh, I put their names as the ask code and translate that as MIDI format. And uh, this is the little piece uh, that I that come out of this this machine. Uh, not bad, right? That's uh, all I did is I plug in some random numbers from my uh, cousin's name, and uh, this is how it showed up. So uh, to, to me, I'm amateur musician. I feel like it's some. Um, I would say something Bach would do. <laughs> so, uh, uh, sorry. And what's more, and the uh, uh, Magenta team, they also have another, another, another model that's uh, um, designed for giving harmonies. And or a, a com accompanies for, for, for the main melody. And uh, for the sake of time, I will just skip this example. Basically, it's very similar. As you can see, we, uh, we, we only had one, uh, one, uh, one line that's only for the melody, but now uh, with this model, it can give some uh, sense of harmonies uh, with that second line. Okay, so uh, to end this talk, I want to uh, use a word from um, uh, lab means that the music is really a uh, hidden exercise in uh, arithmetic and then for mind unconsciously dealing with numbers. So it's really something uh, very fascinating and with the help of machine learning, all the powerful machines, we can uh, retrieve a lot of uh, the hidden patterns that people, um, probably the composer him or herself didn't even realize he was thinking or he was uh, trying to convey at that time. Uh, it's really uh, it's something machine learning can help. It's machine learning can tackle this language and I'm sure that it's, uh, it's going to be a big contribution to the uh, to the society of uh, unveil more uh, more natures and uh, and uh, that's um, basically um, wrap up my top but before I <laughs> before I before I start I, that's something beyond my uh, something not my uh, my slide is that uh, I want to use an analogy that uh, Richard Feynman once used a great physicist once used to explain the discovery of law of the physics. Uh, but actually it's um, it's for any discovery of science. It's like trying to put together, put all the pieces together of the big jigsaw puzzle. And we have all the pieces today that are uh, proliferating rapidly. And they are lying above our tables and many of them can fit with each other. And how do we know that they belong together? And how do we know that they really are part of one big picture? Uh, the truth is we, we're not sure, and it worries us to some extent. But we get encouragement from the common characteristics of these pieces that we are looking at. For example, they all show the blue sky, or they are all made out of same kind of wood. For, uh, all right, and for music, it's a corner of the pieces that are combining art, science, uh, cognitive psychology, some intuition to anesthetic, human unconsciousness, and a lot more. It's, it's really such a complex corner in the big jigsaw picture, uh, but theories still speak to each other. And uh, like cause brings to harmony, melody built on rhythm, and anything misplaced would offend the ear or simply leads to uh, some disorder. So with the power of computer science and machine learning, new discovery either links to the existing ones or becomes a renaissance in a different form. So hopefully, perhaps the development of computational musicology could give us some assurance and uh, inspirations to explore the nature of the self. Thank you. That's uh, all I have today. Uh, could, you, could you please leave your contact information for us, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd love to. So uh, I'm going to leave my... Uh, I'm going to leave my personal email here, and uh, so anybody who was uh, all right. 
yeah, so uh, I just uh, typed my uh, email there. So anybody who who are interested in this kind of topics, and um, um, so it's still an ongoing ongoing project, and we're still trying to find more. Like now, we try to move our focus on the uh, harmonies, how we can uh, like rule based uh, rule based with the certain trees, and how to find more on top of that. And also, if anybody interested in some quantitative finance research, can also reach me out, and we can. Uh, I'm glad to talk to you. Talk to you. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for leaving your uh, contact information, Guy. I enjoyed this talk very much. Thanks, thanks, Eric. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. It's really, um, yeah, it's some fascinating words. I hope you can give some uh, inspirations and I can lead to more inter, more research and combine all the different fields of research. Uh, right. thank, thank you very much. Um, any other questions? I, I would love to hear the, the piece with the harmony. If you oh, yeah, that. yeah, yeah, sure. I can do that. I actually, I was uh, I just, I, I feel like I'm running out of time, but uh, with the harmonies, sounds pretty good. I, I'm, I'm playing there. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's conclusive. It's uh, and what I did, I think uh, the only the only information it's some like a cure or hint that I gave using my cousin's name again, <laughs> and uh, that's probably only even less than one bar for like three or four notes. And then the first uh, algorithm using the long short term memory that generates the whole melody uh, based on the information I gave, and uh, and there are some other parameters like how fast you want it to go and. Uh, and then this is the harmony that it comes up with uh, along the, the melody. <laughs> yeah, glad I got a chance to yeah. show that. Yeah. So, so for me, it, it definitely the harmony enhanced the melody in terms of the, um, mm -hmm. the pleasure of listening to yes. it. Um, and uh, so uh, there must be something about um, how harmony might be necessary to convey meaning mm -hmm. more than melody. Um, or to um, temper the melody in some way. Um, I don't know if you, you heard, um, there was recently, you know, in the news about the, the woman who sang the, the United States national anthem and was singing, you know, in a different pitch every, um, every practically every line that was difficult to listen to if you know <clears throat> the regular melody. But there was a barbershop quartet who um, uh, recorded themselves in four-part harmony singing along with the recording of this person who sang that made it seem like a beautiful thing <laughs> instead of yeah, I... all wrong. <laughs> it, it was interesting what the, the four-part harmony did to that, that, um, uh, that performance. Yeah, that's I, I totally agree. Actually, um, I've read something that uh, especially in the classical music uh, for, for those composers, uh, some of them, they even start from the, uh, the harmonies. They didn't start from melody. Say if they, they want to move from a C chord and to an A sharp, and uh, they would do that first. Then actually some of them even forgot about like Champagne. I think like Champagne has some pieces that's uh, like harmony, I think it's, it's called a, now it's called a, a military a march or something. I could, you can see it's all it's all harmonies or all chords going along. It's no melody. And so it's really I think it's a, it's a bigger big debate, and then then whether computer can 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 compose music, uh, and so that's which which one is even more important. So uh, for for music. So yeah, it's uh, in the yeah, that's definitely some, but it's relatively new in machine learning. I think this this piece that I uh, I showed earlier with the uh, with the harmonies accompanied by the uh, to added to uh, with another uh, 
a machine learning model that developed by Magenta. It's very recent. I think it was either last year or late, uh, late the year before. So it's very recent. It's still in testing, um, testing uh, version. So it's uh, it's it's very exciting to, to see more research to, to be done with uh, both uh, from a perspective from a harmony and from perspective of anatomy. Thanks. All right. Um, so uh, I guess uh, we're gonna. I have to uh, leave my uh, hand over to the next uh, presenter, right? <laughs> I guess so. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's very. It's a pleasure to uh, to be with you to to go through this talk and to feel free to reach me out uh, after in the weekend. Um, talk more about these ideas. Thank you.